Amen. All right, this morning, we see in Ephesians chapter 4 here, Paul is talking about, um, he's talking to the Ephesians, and he's talking to them about, you know, putting off the old man, and in, in giving, you know, them this exhortation on how they should now be acting now that they're saved, he's talking to them a lot about you know, the things that they should be doing now and going forward. And one thing that he brings up a couple times here is the conversation that comes out of their mouth. He calls it corrupt communication in verse number 29. In verse number 22, he calls it, you know, corrupt um, conversation in verse number 22. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, you know, how that, you know, what we say matters. Not, not only, you know, the things that we say matter, but how we say those things matters as well. And, you know, specifically I want to talk to you this morning about the subject of cursing or swearing. And you say, really? Are you really going to talk to me about cursing or swearing? I'm not talking about cursing, you know, like putting a curse on somebody. I'm not talking about, you know, Shimei with David. He was literally cursing David, right? He wanted David to die and all these things, that bloody man. But he was saying, yeah, but what I want to talk to you about is actually using swear words this morning. The words that come out of your mouth. And why am I going to bring this up? Because it's a huge problem today. And I see this problem getting worse and worse and worse. I can literally look back 10, 20 years in my life, and I can see that we are way further down this bad road than we were, you know, just a decade or two ago. It's a huge problem. It's, it's, it's just, it's perverting our entire society today in this country. All right? So let's talk about, you know, cursing, swearing. Let's see what the Bible has to say about it. And then at the end, I want to kind of give you some, some tips on how you can navigate your life. Because look, you are going to deal with this. Especially men, as you go out and you work in this country, you are going to deal with people swearing, unfortunately. I, I'm here to report you, but that it, it's becoming such a normal thing today. Uh, it's, it's sickening. All right. Point number one is this. Look down at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29 that we just read. Look, I even see it, let me, you know, I even see it amongst Christians. I'm sorry. And, you know, you're going to see that maybe I say some things here this morning where you're like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't be, you know, saying things like that. Or is he talking about some of the words that I've said? Yeah, I am. Because we need to kind of reset ourselves here because this is one of those things where you will be affected by other people. You will be affected by people around you. And just because your line is here and somebody else's line is way over here, way worse than your line, I want to show you this morning that the Bible's line is, is way over here. And that's where we need to be. Okay? So we don't need to move along with society, but just be better with society. We need to be what the Bible says that we need to be. The first thing is that cursing, swearing, is literally corrupt communication. Look down at verse number 29 of Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So the Bible says here that, you know, there can be corrupt communication that comes out of your mouth. Corrupt in this, in this context means, you know, infected communication or contaminating communication. All right, contaminated speech. Think about that. And you know what? That sounds about right from where I stand. You know, infected speech. That means that if you speak this way, that it will, you know, it, I mean, in, infected, infection. I mean, do we need to explain that today? No coughing. But it will spread to others is what it means. If you speak this way, you know, it's, it's perfect because, you know, this is true. If you speak this way, if you use swear words, if you use corrupt communication, the people around you, it will affect them. And it will affect them in a negative way. All right, look, the, look down at uh, 2 Timothy in chapter 2. The second point is this, that swearing and using um, corrupt communication is unclean. 
Most swear words, and this is something that I think that is forgotten today, most swear words are references to filthy things. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Look, swearing is profane. And the Bible says that if you speak in a profane way, it will lead you into ungodliness. So you're speaking, you're saying it's just what I say. But the Bible says it will lead you into ungodliness. It will, it will change your actions. It will change first your heart on how you feel about things. You'll be desensitized to things. And then it will change the way you actually act. Most all swear words, even words, look, even words that aren't even considered swear words anymore, they, you know, they're references to profane things. All right, I mean, you drop something, and look, I told myself that when I wrote this sermon that I'm not going to give you any examples of words. You're just going to have to think about it in your mind, and hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying. But if you drop something or you break something, you say, oh, that, that, whatever. You know, that's unfortunate. But, you know, replace unfortunate with some other word that you would probably use. Look, those words, even though they might not be considered a swear word by the general public out there today, they're still references to filthy, profane things. And so we shouldn't be using them. Right? Look, they have profane and perverse origins and original meaning. So just because, you know, you've made speaking like that, a vain repetition, and it's lost that meaning to you? Because that's what will happen with vain repetitions, right? If you say things over and over and over and over again, you lose the meaning of it. That's why Jesus said, don't pray to me that way. I want you to pray to me with, things that, with words that matter to you, with, with the thoughts of your heart. You know, he gave us a, an outline of things that, you know, a structure of the way that we should pray. But he's like, don't use vain repetitions to me because the words lose their meaning. If you constantly use swear words and you constantly use these pseudo swear words, look, they, they'll lose their meaning to you, but they're still profane to other people. If you have some, you know, Bible believing Christian and you're speaking that way in front of them, they're going to be like, ugh, because they haven't lost. You know, somebody that doesn't speak that way, it hasn't lost that meaning. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse number 8. Colossians calls it filthy communication. But now ye also put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Look, this has become the new status quo. I'm telling you. And I'm sick of it, personally. You know, look, I often wonder about... I'm going to talk to you about women at work a little bit this morning. I often wonder about women in the workplace. Because, look, I see women in the workplace. Luckily, in my field, I haven't worked with a lot of women, but I do see women in the workplace. And, look, I would never want my mom or my sister or somebody hearing the things that go on in the workplace. I would never want that. And look, this is one of the things, and the reason that I bring it up is because this is the one of the things that in my lifetime, my, look, my career, 21 years, I've seen change. I have seen this change. Where people, you know, look, it's a sign, it's a sign of the character of our nation. It really is. It's a sign of the character of the men of our nation. I'm sad to report to you. Because look, it wasn't always like this. Even in my short career, it was not always like this. Where this, you know, there used to be a change on the way that a man would speak, whether it would be if there was a, a woman in the room or not a woman in the room. There used to be a difference. There is no longer. There is no longer. And it was not like this. And it really wasn't like this, you know, many, many years ago. Let me read you a letter written years ago by a general to his army. And, so, and let me, and as, you're re, as you're listening to this letter, think about whether a general today would write this to the men in his unit or in, in his army. The general is sorry to be informed that the foolish and wicked practice of profane cursing and swearing 
a vice hitherto little known in our American army is growing into fashion. He's saying this, this vice was, was, was not known in our army before. He's like, I'm hearing of it happening now. Imagine, you're like, this must be like 500 years ago, right? Listen, a vice hitherto little known in our American army is growing into fashion. He hopes, he's speaking about himself, he hopes that the officers will, by example as well as influence, endeavor to check it, and that both they and the men will reflect that we can little hope of the blessing of heaven on our army if we insult it by our impiety and folly. He's saying that by the cursing, they're insulting heaven, is what he's saying. Added to this, it is a vice so mean and low without any temptation that every man of sense and character detests. You hear that? And despises it. He's saying any man of sense and character despises swearing and cursing. Is that the way it is today? Are you kidding me? Everybody speaks in disgusting language today in the world. But he says that he says that every man of sense and character will detest this. That's what this general says. Signed August 3rd, 1776, George Washington. We've come a long ways from this. Look, there used to be a time that I can remember where men would watch their mouth when a woman was in the room. In the workplace and just elsewhere. In, in my short life, think about it. It's changed very fast. I mean, women in the workforce, I mean, are, are you, you know, the, this, the problem is this, folks. The same moral character that sent women to work in this country is, is, is still dropping in the men of this country as they're at work with these women. And you know what? It, it's one of the greatest things, it's one of the greatest things that you can do to be known as a person of character today is watch what you say. Because you will stand out. If you do not swear, you will stick out like a sore thumb today. People will, re people will realize it. If you start a new job, people will realize it the first day of your job. I mean, it's like, it reminds me kind of like tattoos. I mean, everybody used to want to get a tattoo to be unique, right? I'm going to get a tattoo and be unique. You're unique now if you don't have a tattoo. I mean, if you don't have, I mean, you have tat, people tattooed from the head to the toes. It's normal now to have a tattoo. It's not odd. It's now, it's odd to not swear today. It is odd. You will stick out. And it's like, you know what? I'll take it. I'm glad that you stick out if you don't swear. You know, you're the weird one. The third point is this. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. And this is probably, you know, the biggest point to make right here. Exodus chapter 20, look at verse number 7. The third point is this. Swearing is blasphemous. Swearing is blasphemous. Look at Exodus 20 and verse number 7. The Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of, thy, of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that take his name in vain. So, this could mean, you know, using the Lord's name as a swear word. People do that all the time, too. But also, look, it could also, look, it's talking about taking the Lord's name in vain. So one of those, one of those ways that you could do that is like by literally using God's name as a swear word. You know, something bad happens and you use the Lord's name. I mean, people do it all the time. You know, they're, they, maybe they're not saved, but I mean... I mean, God forbid somebody that was saved would take God's name and use it as a swear word. God forbid. But look, using God's name in vain could, could be more than just using it as a swear word. You could use God's name to justify sin in your life. You could use God's name to justify, you know, just a, not wanting to do a clear commandment in the Bible. I mean, what's, what's the big one we always talk? You know, coming to church is a big commandment, right? I mean... Whatever sin that is in your life, or whatever situation that is in your life, you know, oh, it's God's will that, you know, I, you know, do this, and that, that reason I can't go to church. No, you're using God's name in vain. Because, like, the Bible says that you are to do this specific thing, 
and anything that it takes you to do this specific thing is what you need to do. That's God's will. Look, God doesn't speak to us verbally. That's why we have to read the Bible. When there's a clear commandment in the Bible commanding you to do something, whether it's, you know, be sober or go to church or go soul winning or whatever, look, that's just what you do. And if you're doing something that is, is not allowing that, then, you know, that's not God's will. It's that simple. So don't say that, oh, I just think it's God's will for me to be right here right now. If it's stopping you from doing something that is a clear commandment in the Bible, you're using God's name in vain. Because look, God, I mean, God's will is never going to contradict His Word. So don't sit there and try to plug your will you know, into God, you know, plug God's will into what, you, what is your will. I mean, people do this all the time. It's using God's name in vain. It, it's using God's name in vain. Look, you could, you could claim God's word falsely. You know, you could, look, misusing the Bible to make points that you want to make. You know, look, all you men that are going to, you know, preach on, on preaching night, and some men are going to be preaching full-length sermons here, you know, hopefully in the next year or whatever, whenever, you know. But look, here's a, here's, a, here's a sermon writing tip. Don't take one of your ideas and then try to, you know, f make the Bible, like, prove it. You start with something in the Bible, and, you, and then you write the sermon from there. The, the, the root is God's Word, not some idea that you have, Right? I mean, look, at, you know, lots of people do it, right? Lots of people just have, like, some idea and then just try to grab Bible. Because, look, you could, you could make the Bible say whatever you wanted if you just want to grab a verse here, grab a verse there. Make sure you're starting with God's Word and you're plugging, you, you know, you're, you're, it's good to have ideas and applications and creativity when writing sermons, for sure. But make sure you're starting with God's ideas and you're building from there. All right. That's why, like, you know, I was really nervous, and you know, I still kind of am nervous about you know having to preach three sermons a week because I'm like, you know, who would want to listen to me for three sermons a week? I mean, who? I mean, think about it. You listen to me for three hours a week. How could I possibly be interesting for three sermons a week? But look, it's not me. Amen. It's just it's that that that's my that's my say, that's my parachute, right? is I don't have to sit here and be interesting and come up with like a giant spider story every single sermon because I can't do it because I'm not that interesting, right? I'm not that interesting, but the Bible is interesting. So all I have to do, that's why Wednesday nights are the easiest nights because it's just a chapter in the Bible and that's what we're going to talk about, right? So look, God's Word is God's Word. We, we go with God's Word and we build from there. That's what we do, all right? So don't use, you know, false Bible versions are, are claiming God's Word. But they're not God's Word. They're changing God's Word. But they're claiming it. That's, that's using, that's using God, God's name in vain. Okay? So don't, look, Bible words, here's another one. Bible words. I, I don't know how many times I've heard, oh, that word, you know, somebody uses a swear word. And they're like, it's in the Bible. No. Just because a word is in the Bible, look, if you're not using it in the context of the context that the Bible used it, you're using God's word in vain. If you're sitting there and you're, you're swearing, and then you're saying that particular word is in the Bible, so it's okay. I mean, first of all, most people are joking. It's not funny, though. You're using God's word in vain. All right? So look, use it in the context that the Bible uses it. Otherwise, you're using God's word in vain. All right, so there's lots of examples of corrupt communication, people out there, I mean, taking God's name in vain, using it as a swear word, people just speaking filthy, disgusting language out there. So the question is this. I mean, the question is this. How do we navigate this? You say, I'm not going to do it. How do we navigate a world like this? You know, and, and the ladies... In this church, if you stay home and you homeschool your kids and, and you know, you're, you're, you're protected from that, thank God. Another good reason, by the way, to have you know, your wife stay home and raise your children and teach your children. Because look, your wife is not... The, the woman is the weaker vessel. They're not designed to be able to go into that garbage. And I, and I hate seeing women in it and having to put up with it, personally. 
So the first, the first way to navigate this is this, folks. Just don't do it at all. That's step one. Okay, you say, that seems pretty simple. You know, look, train yourself. Don't go, look, don't go around saying pseudo swear words either. Because guess what? If somebody else, you know, swears and, and then you use, like, you use the same sentence, but you use a pseudo swear word that is some made up non word, and you're, you're, it's, it's filthy communication. It's corrupt communication. You notice how it didn't say corrupt words? It said corrupt. You're communicating in the same way. You're communicating in the same way. It's no better. Made up words for the word of God, same thing. You're communicating. in the, people, people that swear will just look at you as a wimp. Anyway. People that swear will just be like, oh, you're just a wimp. You're still speaking the exact same. Does that make sense? You're still speaking in the same context. You're still doing it the same thing as them. Don't do it. You need to speak differently than others. You need, look, you need to have different communication than other people. And that will set you apart even further. But what will, I mean, you know what it will show, actually? It will show that you have a different heart than people that constantly swear and curse. You know, I mean, if somebody, you know, something bad happens and somebody says, what the blank or whatever, you know, and you're just like, okay, how can we fix this problem? I mean, that's a different way to communicate. That's a different way altogether of, of dealing with a problem, right? I mean, it's a different way of communicating. It's a different, I mean, somebody else, you know, swears at you or comes at you, you know, just focus on the solution to the problems at hand and it will show everyone there that you have a different heart towards situations. And you'll be surprised how many people will appreciate that different attitude towards situations. Don't have a swearing mindset. It's that simple. And it does nothing anyway, except make you look stupid, in my opinion. Point number two on how to navigate through this in the world is this. Don't get too casual with unsaved people. Or, pe or, or people that swear. Hopefully there's not, you know, saved people that are just, you know, swearing like sailors out there. But look, when people think that they can relax and tell jokes, uh, you know, that's when the profanity and the filthy communication will begin. Look, around people you know especially to be profane, just, I mean, this, this is what I do. It's just all business all the time. That's it. I mean, people probably think I'm too serious, but that's okay. It's got to be all business all the time around people like that. Look, you should be working at work anyway. I mean, you shouldn't be, you know, look, avoid lunches, avoid after work things, you know, all these situations, just avoid them all together because that's where things will get too casual and that's where all this, these, these conversations that you don't want to be in will come up. This is where things get inappropriate, unfortunately. So always stay appropriate and stay formal, especially with people that you know to be profane, period. All right, the third one is this, and this is gonna be, this, this will take some courage to do this. But, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Pavlov's dog. We're going to talk about conditioning the people around you. All right? The third point is this on how to do this is that you need to specifically measure your reactions to people. Because especially as you go into situations where you don't know people or you don't know, you know, the who's who in situations, you're going to end up in these types of situations, especially men. You're going to end up walking into a, a group of five guys and there's a conversation that starts or has been going on. You find out about it. Look, never show approval at all. If you're in a group of people and you're talking about work or business or whatever and somebody brings up something that is inappropriate and everybody laughs, you don't even crack a smile. This is what I do. It works. Because people know. Pavlov's dog, that's what it is. Pavlov's dog, if you haven't heard about it, it was this, this scientist and he did this experiment with this dog, all right? And look, when a dog saw a steak, the dog's mouth would start sal salivating. So what Pavlov did was 
every time that he was going to give the dog a steak, instead he rung a bell, and then the dog came, and then after the dog came, he would give them the steak. And after he did this over and over and over again, pretty soon, when he rang the bell, the dog would start salivating. Not at the steak, but at the bell. Because he's conditioning the dog to be trained to know that you know, the steak is coming right after the bell. And it actually conditioned a response in the dog. So look, if you do this, it will condition people to act differently around you. It will. It might take some time. But it will condition people. But if you look, if you if you show approval, maybe you don't laugh. Oh, I'm just not going to laugh as loud as everybody else. No, no, you don't crack a smile. And whenever something like that is going on, you politely excuse yourself. I mean, people will figure it out. That's that's the bell ringing. And it might look it it might be uncomfortable. It might be uncomfortable for you. And you know, I often think that you know people probably think I'm pretty boring, but. I could care less. I mean, literally, I could care less. People will learn. You need to train the people around you. And you can do it in a polite way. You can do it in a polite way, but don't you crack a smile or give even the slightest hint of approval. Look, and my wife has told me, and I've told you, you all this, you all probably already know this, but when I don't approve of something, yeah, I mean, it's all over my face. So, I mean, that's a benefit in this case. That's a benefit. All right? Point number four is this. Intervene when necessary and appropriate. Now, this is a touchy one, okay? But look, sometimes you can say something. Sometimes you can say something. When you have authority in a situation, it's pretty easy, okay? We'll talk about authority first, but We'll also talk about when you don't have authority. So if you have authority in a situation, it's pretty easy. You can simply establish your leadership as being against profanity. It's, it's pretty simple. You can, I mean, if you own the company or you're the boss or whatever, it's pretty easy to establish that you don't like that kind of behavior. And you usually don't have to say anything. Usually it just kind of it comes across because you know, people want to please the boss, they want to please the owner of the company. They want to, you can establish that. You can establish that culture in your company, in your group, in your workplace, whatever. All right. Remember uh, George Washington's quote, he says, he hopes, he's talking about the general himself, that the officers will by example as well as influence. He's saying, the officers, I want you to take the, the role here to establish the example. And that will influence people. Because he knew how it worked. He knew that if the officers would establish this culture, that it would be, it would just, it would spread throughout the ranks. Right? I mean, he knew what he was talking about. So you can influence those around you, especially if you have the authority to do so. That's why, I mean, that's, that's why leaders are so important. And it's so important that as a leader, in whatever situation, whether it's your family or your workplace or wherever, that you get it right. Because you can spread good influence or you can spread bad influence. You can also establish a culture of just not caring. You can also establish a culture. Look, it's not enough to just, you know, maybe you don't speak that way, but everybody else does and you don't really seem to care and you laugh at stuff and you think it's funny. So you establish that culture that it doesn't matter. You need to establish that culture that it does matter. Look, and here's what I've, here's what I've found. People will like it. People will appreciate it. And especially like with, with the whole women in the workforce thing, look, I have taken so many anti-harassment classes, it is not funny. But you know what? I agree with them. Because I don't think that some woman should have to go to work and be harassed by some filthy conversation. I mean, who would think that that's right as a Christian? But I mean, I, mean, I actually think that those anti-harassment classes, you know, benefit the Christian as well. Because that kind of, I don't want that conversation going on either. You don't have to be a woman to not want to hear that stuff. I don't want to hear it either. So that anti-harassment stuff, I really don't have too many problems with that. It's good. I mean, who, who wants to listen to that garbage all the time? You know, it, it's funny. This happened to me um, in a... I, I had a small you know, group that, 
that I was leading a few years ago, and some new guy came into this group, and he came in, and there was a woman in this, on this team. And this guy came in, and he just, like, his first day, he just started, like, dropping, you know, bombs. And, like, somebody had turned, somebody turned to me after he left, and they're just like, he didn't get the memo. But the thing is that everyone just, I never, there was no memo. It, it's just established. And then when somebody comes in and they don't fit in, it's obvious. But look, it's nice. People like it, first of all. People like that there's not that kind of conversation going around them. And then, and then when you see the people that used to be like that, you realize how many people speak like that because everybody else speaks like that. And that's the only reason they do it. But when they go home, look, I often think about these guys. I often think about these guys. I'm like, you speak that way around your children. You go home. I mean, you're going to come here, and you're going to be, you know, in this group or in this meeting, and you're going to speak like that. Do you speak like that around your kids? Do you speak like that around your wife? I often think that. But look, they, they shouldn't if they do. And so it's nice to see people change for the better. And I mean, you could be part of that. You say, I don't have any authority. I just started, you know, I don't have any authority. Well, this is more difficult, but it's still possible. All right? Look, the first step is to not be around it, to remove yourself from it. If you have no authority in the situation, just don't be around it. Nobody can force you to be around that type of, you know, language. And it's also, and I want you to be careful here, but it's also in extreme cases, if you feel you can do so without offense, it's okay to say something. It's okay to say something. Look, we're not talking about being in a group of five people and trying to dress somebody down about the way they speak. That's probably not going to go well for you. But what I'm talking about, especially, I've done this especially in cases of, you know, blasphemy. I have, I have pulled somebody that I work with. I had no authority in the situation. I worked with this man, and we worked together every day, and he would just use the name of Jesus all the time as a swear word. And I, I just pulled him aside, and I was like, look, um, you know, could you just not say that? In a nice way, I just said, look, that, you know, that's, it's offensive to me. Could you not use that word? Amen. And no problem. No problem. I didn't dress him down in front of 10 people. You know, I, but I just politely asked him to not do that. And guess what? He stopped saying that. He stopped saying pretty much every other thing. Amen. Because he understood that, you know, it was offensive to me. We worked well together. He was, look, he wasn't a reprobate, okay? I mean, he, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a terrible person. You'll find these people, okay? If you have some just wicked, disgusting, you know, pervert that you work with, there's nothing you're going to do there. There's nothing you're going to do there. And the best thing is just to avoid that person. And look, if, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. These filthy, vulgar people, you just need to, you need to, you need to avoid them, period. And if you're in a workplace, I, I've, seen, I've seen this as well, and I've been worried about it with my own son going into the workforce. That's why I asked, you know, when Garrett started working a couple years ago, I would, you know, I would ask him all kinds of questions. He probably didn't understand why I was asking these questions. We sit down at the dinner table. Who are you working with? Who is your boss? What's his name? How old is he? Is he married? Uh, what, what, oh, uh, what, what's he, um, is he a nice guy? Because I knew that if somebody was filthy, you know, Garrett wouldn't answer positively in a lot of these questions. Is he a nice guy? How does he speak? I would ask that simple question. Is there a lot of vulgarity? You know, things like that. Because he's not in authority where he was working, and I knew that. But look, if you get in a workplace where there's nothing but filthy, vulgar people, you need to find a different workplace. It's that simple. It is that simple. Look, and I, and I, I don't want to, because look, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse number 7. You say, I don't, but I don't speak that way. But I don't talk like that. The problem is this. In 2 Peter chapter 2, it's talking about Lot. And it's talking about when the angels took him out, and it says, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy, filthy conversation of the wicked. Look, it affected him, and it will affect you. It will affect how you think, it will affect how you, how it'll affect your heart. 
And it, and it may start affecting how you speak. You may start, you know, saying things that you normally wouldn't have said. And you become, you become vexed with that filthy conversation. Look, there's, there's some, you know, I don't like blanket statements, but there's some trades, and I'm not going to list them, where I would never want my, my children going into. Just because it's just, I've seen it, it's just every single time. It's just a certain type of people are in that trade. And they speak a certain way, and, they're all, and I'm not saying that, you know, that there's not good ones, okay? But the point is that if you're in a workplace where it's nothing but filthy, vulgar people, you need to not work there. You need to not be in that job. That's not something we are to be, you know, we are to go out in the world and work, the Bible says. But there's got to be a line, because it will affect you. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, our nation as a whole is getting more and more vulgar. And I don't know, you know, what it is. I think, I bet you that the internet has a big, a, you know, a big part of this responsibility. The fact that just filth on the internet is, is not, it's not taboo anymore. Filth is not taboo anymore. It's so sad. It's so sad. Look at Ezekiel 36 and verse 23. What does that mean for us? The Bible says, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. So he's saying, look, God's saying I have a great name that was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. So look, he's, he's saying that you know, the heathen profaned, and then you profaned with them. I mean, look, you will become more profane if you're around this stuff. Turn to Leviticus chapter 21.7. The Bible talks about profane women, too. Because I'm seeing women get more profane. I'm not only seeing men act profane around women, but it's affecting the women. It's affecting the culture. The Bible talks about profane women. Look at Leviticus 21, verse number 7. Caution, not politically correct. Upcoming. Leviticus 21 and verse number 7. They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy unto his God. Look, if you say, oh, whore, it said whore. Well, look, if only women could understand this passage today, they, I mean, that speaking profanity is going, I mean, basically, this is equating profanity to being a whore. This is basically saying that, look, I mean, look, I'm for women. You understand? We're at, we're at the park yesterday, and there's this teenage girl dressed completely inappropriately, and she's with these three guys. And they're sitting around this thing in the park. My wife and I were walking laps around the park, so we kept going past this one spot. And I'm listening to the conversation of the guys that are with this girl, and it's disgusting. How do you think they're, I'm, I'm just like, I'm, I'm like, I'm just, I'm like, why, where's your dad? Why are you there? Why are you there? Why are you there? Why are you there? What are you doing with these dirt bags? What are you doing? How do you think that they treat that girl? I didn't hear her speak, but I, it's very likely that she spoke very similar to them in a profane manner. But what is she doing with those profane people because they will equate her to what the Bible says right here. And that's how they will treat her. That's how she will dress. It's a disaster. Why would anyone want to go down this road? Look, if the women, look, if women in the, are in the workplace, if there's women at the job, that's not my business. I am not their husband, but look, they should be treated appropriately. Period. But it's not happening. It's not happening from my experience because the same conversations that I hear, I know the women in that office here as well. I know the women in those workplaces, they hear those conversations at all. Look, I understand that they shouldn't be there, but look, they shouldn't not be there for the reason that all men are filthy dirtbags, okay? Does that make sense? They should be there for other reasons that the Bible says, but look, it's not my business where some man, you know, has his wife, but look, Women should be treated appropriately always. And women should act appropriately. And that's why the Bible says in Leviticus 21.7, look, 
Men can learn from this too, because guess what? How you speak will in many ways dictate how you are treated. Look, speak like a lady, you will be treated like one. Or, you know, you should be treated like one. Guys, you speak like a rapper, you're going to be treated like one. That's, that's it. I mean, no one will take you seriously if you talk that way. These people became and started speaking profanely as the heathen is the bottom line. That's how the heathen, look, that's how the heathen speak. That's not how we should speak. It's another, look, it's, it's, a, it's, another, it's another case for separation, right? But we as men especially have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll go to Ephesians chapter 5, we'll go to Proverbs 18, and then we'll finish up. For those that swear, look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3. The Bible says, But fornication and uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. Convenient meaning proper or becoming, but rather giving of thanks. Look at Proverbs 18. And this is the one that hits home for me. Proverbs 18, and verse number 6. The Bible says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Look, ultimately, these people that like swear, you know, they use five swear words in two sentences, they're, they come across as fools. They come across as fools. I mean, if that's how you speak, you have no command of the English language. Or you choose to not use it if you do. Look, because choosing to not swear, choosing to be different in that way, it, it, it's a choice. It's a choice. The nation, our nation, is becoming more vulgar with both men and women. Period. It's unfortunate. Don't do it. Don't mimic it. Don't, don't think by changing the, the word around and, and, and coming up with a pseudo swear word that doesn't, you know, speak differently. Amen. Speak differently. Avoid it. Change it where you can. I mean, we can be a force for good out there changing some of these things. If we see some inappropriate situations around ladies or even even around men you know we can do what we can as Christians to change those situations to be an influence for good to lead that situation down the right path look I mean it's serious in, in Exodus chapter 20 when you know the God talked about taking his name in vain it said the Lord will not hold him guiltless it is something that that's what you need to think about as a Christian that this is something that will be punished by God. It will be something that's punished by God. We should be, in, in this society that we live in today, you should, you should stick out. You should stand out just by your conversation, just by showing what's in your heart through your mouth. You should, I mean, people will know, I mean, and look, it, it's a great, it's a great way to, to garner some blessings in your life too because it's something that people will notice right away and most people will like it. Whether they like it or, I mean, whether, whether you think so or not, most people will appreciate it. They will appreciate the fact that you don't speak like everybody else and that you're, you're taking that culture out into the world. All right? So, it's a big deal. Don't do it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your word. We thank you for um, today, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful day outside. I ask that you um, bless church today, bless our entire day, um, bless soul winning. Um, keep us safe out there and bring us back for church this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.